Welcome back to another Youth Centered Podcast. This is the first of 2021, and uh, we're very excited to have Principal Joe Clark from the Franklin School. And Joe, this is take two. As some people know, we uh, we did a rehearsal with Joe, and then we had some malfunctions in our equipment. <coughs> Excuse me. And we had to uh, basically scrap it and start all over again. So, Joe, thanks again for coming on the Youth Center podcast. Oh, yeah. Happy to be back, Rick. And happy to kick off 2021 with you. Exactly. As we kicked out 2020 pretty quickly. <laughs> Joe, for those who don't know you, obviously you're a very big face and voice around the Franklin School community. But for the rest of our people in North Andover, who is Joe Clark? What's the, what's the bio and the Joe Clark files? <laughs> Well, um, so I grew up, born and raised in Lynn, Massachusetts. I went through the public school system in Lynn, graduated from Lynn English High School, went on to study education at Endicott College, pursued a master's degree and eventually a CAGS as well. And I started my career right here in North Andover, teaching over at the Atkinson School in second grade. After a few years, after about eight years, over there, went off to Endicott College and taught in the School of Education there for a couple of years and worked primarily with the student teachers and helping them through their experiences. And then um, fate struck and you know I was living in North Andover with my wife at the time and, oh, she's still she's my wife. She's still your wife, I think. <laughs> she's still my wife, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to remember if that happened before or after we got married. It was a blur for a few years there. Yeah. And, um, and then Mary Lou McCarthy, um, announced her retirement, and I applied, and the rest is history. And you've been the Franklin School principal for how long now? This is my seventh year. Seventh year. Yeah. Let me ask you a question that we actually didn't do in the, uh, our rehearsal for the for the Joe Clock podcast. Is I'm always intrigued in hearing about uh, a male who teaches at the elementary school level, and obviously lots of males teach at the elementary school level, but. And obviously my history in town here, I see much more females almost uh, teaching at the elementary school level. Um, do you see that? And were you one of the few males when you were at the Atkinson? And why do you think that probably is? Um, well, yes, uh, there are very few males around. I was one of two at the Atkinson, DJ Sturdivant, who you know, who's right, over DJ, at the yeah. middle school now. He was a fifth grade teacher when I started over there. And then... Um, and then I think it was, I think for a while it was just me, DJ, and Bill Brady. Bill Brady, <laughs> correct, yeah. And then DJ moved on to the middle school. I moved on. Um, I've since hired a male teacher in fifth grade. But you're right. It's 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 rare to see the male um, teachers at the elementary level. Any sense of why that is? You know, I don't know. I yeah. I absolutely love working with the younger kids. Sure. And you know, I grew up working at a summer camp, an overnight summer camp, just down the street in Boxford on Styles Pond, Camp Rotary. And, you know, we had heaps and heaps and heaps of males, you know, being counselors and working with these kids and just absolutely loving it. But for whatever reason, they went off to different paths. And right. Very few of us ended up going into education. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. We'll continue to monitor that. And uh, yeah. I think I'll, ask, I'll ask DJ that question also. But So take me back to your early years with uh, teaching at the Atkinson. Obviously, Atkinson uh, is another one of our big elementary schools, a little bit different than your school with the Atkinson, I mean, with the Franklin right now. Uh, but obviously, wonderful kids, wonderful parents. What was it like uh, being an elementary school teacher in the classroom? Oh, it, it fun. Man, Rick, it, it's awesome. There's there's nothing like being a classroom teacher. It is you just form these bonds. You have these twenty to thirty kids, however many you have that year, many, that year, and you form these bonds with these kids. And you know, you know, you know me. I'm a bit of a goof, and I'm the one jumping on tables for math class and things like that. So it was all about just having fun and really making sure that to make an impact on these kids but also getting them through the curriculum and helping them learn and progress throughout the time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade those years for anything. So it was a great experience as you headed on to the rest of your education career as an administrator. Oh, exactly. I know uh, prior to our first rehearsal, I was telling the kids I was going to have, some of the kids here at the youth center was going to have you on here, and the high school kids were wondering if you still uh, taught on top of the table and everything <laughs> else. So obviously that was something that a couple of kids remembered vividly. They just thought you were hysterical, and they liked the way that you were just 
a little different. And I say that in a positive way, um, in the fact that my wife you, says that about me too. <laughs> <laughs> that you're really engaged, and, and for these two kids, it's it's a fond memory they have of that. So, so you get the Franklin School job, and again, as I said, um, not to compare our different neighborhood schools or whatever. Frank is a little bit different than uh, the Atkinson or the Kittredge, Thompson, even the Sergeant. Um, what was it like taking on your first administrative role in our community? Whew. I was greener than green, Rick. It was, um, you know, I I think back to that a lot, and I'm very thankful to my final interview committee, which was Hutch, Gilly, and uh, Jim Mealy. Okay. And taking a shot on me because I look back to my first few years, and I think, how did I survive? I didn't know what I didn't know, you right. know for those first few years. But it was such an amazing feeling the bonds weren't quite as strong as they were as when I was a classroom teacher, but I was able to make bonds with so many more kids and feel like I was making such a bigger impact with so many more kids and supporting my teachers, supporting my families. And once I got kind of my footing, I really just felt like it was time to take off. And, and I'm very proud of the work that our teachers and students and parents have done over these six and a half years. Yeah, you've done some great work, which we'll get into it. Let me ask you, when, as you were looking, when you were still in the classroom mm -hmm. and you, you, know, you took the risk of you know, applying for a principal's job, um, had that always been the plan? Were you looking to move up in education or was it just like timing? There was an opening, hey, I might try this. How did, how did that all work out? You know what? It was always sort of a plan in the back of my mind. Um, I go back to my camp, and Gilly makes fun of me every time I talk about my camp. But um, he, uh, I was a counselor, then I became a unit head, then I became ropes course director, and then program director, assistant director. And it was all about just making an impact on And how many, how many kids can I make an impact on? Like, how can I make that reach spread as far as I can? And it was always kind of the same. In the back of my head, I think I always knew that as much as I loved being a classroom teacher, I wanted to make a bigger impact. And I actually applied, oh, I don't remember, I think it was maybe 2012. It was the same year I left for Endicott. I applied for the Thompson School principal when Correct. I think it was John Macleer might have retired. And, um, oh no, it was when Gilly was leaving. That's what it was, it was when Gilly was leaving. And I, I say now, kind of going back to what I just said about being greener than green, it, the best thing that ever happened to me was not getting, not getting that the job. job. Um, and it went to a very capable woman, Laureen Marks, who sure. everyone knows out there is our assistant superintendent. Um, but by not getting that job, it pushed me to kind of expand my horizon a little bit. And that's where I landed back at Endicott in a different role, obviously, than a student. Now I was working as an, as an administrator. And that's where I started to develop kind of my leadership style in what was – essentially a comfortable place. I knew Endicott, I knew the staff, I knew the fact, most of the faculty were there when I was there. And I was able to kind of hone my skills a little bit and be better prepared for when, if and when, something came up. Sure. You said when you got the job, uh, it was interesting. You didn't know what you didn't know. What do you, what do you mean by that? I, I mean, I think I know what you mean by that. But um, as you look back at it now, how do you relate to that? I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> so I didn't know. You know, I, I went in, and I think a lot of uh, relating back to when I was starting teaching, you know, you think about, okay, yeah, 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 we're going to have fun with the kids. We're going to do this. But teaching's hard work. There's a lot of hard work to it. And I think part of me getting this principal job was thinking to myself, man, all right, it's going to be like a classroom teacher, but just bigger. But there's so many more pieces that go into it. There's so much more... Um, working with parents, which I didn't really have a tremendous amount of experience working with parents. You know, sure. I talked to parents, I communicated two-way communication as a teacher, but actually working with them and working with the PTO, who, by the way, my PTO has been fantastic for these six, six and a half years. Um, but just really building relationships in a different way. And I think, I mean, when you talk about education, it all comes down to building relationships. Sure. And I think the manner in which you did that was different than what I thought it was going to be. 
and I had to learn that. Absolutely. What would you describe? Um, obviously, you've been there for six and a half years, and we're going to get into the year like no other in a minute. But <laughs> what is Joe Clark's leadership style? How would you define that? Who knows? <laughs> day to day, Rick. Day to day. Um, no, I try to. I try to lead by example. And I think the most important thing I do in, in terms of leading the staff, I think the idea of remembering what it was like to be a classroom teacher is vitally important. I think it's difficult to do that as years progress, but I work really hard at that. And I try to constantly reflect on, okay, if I were in the classroom and my principal was asking me to do this, how would I feel about that? How would that look? How would I be able to manage that on top of everything else? Not even to get into the year, <laughs> the sure. year like no other, but on a normal year. So I think leading by example, reflecting on how other, people's, other people feel, like thinking about those raised values and empathy and how it's gonna impact. And then build it with the kids, building positive relationships, being visible, talking to them, saying hi. Back before this, High fives every morning on the way into school to start the day off with something good, you know? Absolutely. And I've been watching from afar uh, I'm a, uh, of your culture. I think you've built a, a nice culture at Franklin. Everything from, you know, your your morning minutes, so to speak, and some of your communications with obviously not just the students, but obviously with parents or whatever. How would you describe the culture at the Franklin School? Unbelievable. I mean, I, I was fortunate when I worked at Endicott and I was working with the student teachers to see many different schools and many different leadership styles and many different teaching styles. But the culture at Franklin is, you know, I call us a Franklin family and I say that truthfully, like everyone looks out for each other. Everyone is always looking out for the best interest of everyone else. Staff puts the kids above, above anything. The kids work hard. They, you know, we talk about raise values. We, I mean, I cram raise values down their throats. The teachers cram raise values down their throats and they show it. Like sure. they're respectful. They work hard. They try their best. They do the right thing and they're kind. There's not much more you can ask for. Yeah. No, those are obviously the pillars of the school department and obviously the Franklin School. And it's, uh, it's evident to me, um, you know, we don't work on a daily basis, but, you know, hearing the stories, I work with a lot of Franklin parents. I obviously work with a lot of kids who are Franklin kids, former students of yours here at the Franklin. And uh, it's safe to say that there's a, a really good culture there. And, and obviously you're, you become the architect or at least the motivator behind all of that continued culture. So let's talk about um, year 19, um, I'm sorry, 2019, uh, 2020. Starts out like any normal year. Um, and then I know personally, after, after New Year's last year, I was watching all this stuff happen in the world. And, you know, you sit there and you're like, hey, is this going to affect us here? And then I'm, I'm sure you were in meetings probably as early as late February into early March like I was. Um, and this was more than just across the, the pond, so to speak, or, or in China. This was something that was going to happen. And then the infamous day uh, that will live in history here was March 13th, Friday. Uh, it was announced <clears throat> that we were going to be stopping schools. And we actually were waiting here at the youth center for the school to make the decision. There was some talk previous couple of days of whether you're going to close or not, because we kind of follow a bit of what the school does. Uh, that's changed a little bit during the pandemic, but our timelines, whether it be vacations or whatever, we kind of follow the school time. So on March 13th, pretty much everything stops. Um, and I think you and I went home on that Friday saying, hey, not too bad to maybe have a two-week vacation. I'm a little tired and burnt out or whatever. And that two-week vacation obviously turned into a four-week vacation. And then it was, we're not going back to school this year. And for us, it was, we're not opening the youth center. We had to reinvent ourselves during the spring. We helped with a lot of you know, things like the food drive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but tell me, what was it like being the Franklin principal when the news came down that you were closing? Uh, and then the connection for basically the next close to three months. Um, take us through that whole, like, version of remote learning, how to connect with your kids, relationship building. What was it like running a school, taking care of your kids, your parents during that period of time? Yeah, it's funny, you know, we call that remote learning, but it was, it was 
educational crisis management. I mean, we had no idea. We had, nobody had ever planned for that. Nobody had ever done anything like that before. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, like you said, we were down for two weeks. And I was like, okay, we're out for two weeks. You know, we'll regroup. We'll, we'll figure it out. And we've sent them home with our beyond the classroom stuff. And sure. like, okay, that'll, that'll suffice for a couple weeks. And then it turned, like you said, turned into a couple more, and then a couple more, and then it was the year. And the hardest part, you know, we talked about earlier about relationships, and it was hard to maintain those relationships. It was difficult because we couldn't, you know, we, we had these Google Meets, but we, we had to teach our students, we had to teach our staff, we had to teach ourselves how to use the, these Google platforms that we weren't familiar with. You know, at the elementary level, we don't, utilize those as much maybe at the higher levels that they might use for like homework assignments and things like sure. that so you know we really had we were really starting from square one and the teachers rose to the occasion and i can't take any credit for that because i wasn't there i was in my house trying to communicate through email or having google meets you know i offered hey anybody want to google Meet? come on we'll, we'll do it and we had our staff meetings but it was hard you know, it was it was very, very hard. And it was hard for everybody. It was hard for parents who were trying to figure out how to log into Google Classroom, why there was only X amount of work and this and that. And we were, you know, Gilly uses the expression, you know, we were building the plane as building the plane as we were flying it. And I don't think I ever truly felt that expression until sure. the spring. Um, so when you talk about communication, you know, you, you made reference to my morning announcements and it was funny. I was like, oh, I'll do these for two weeks. No problem. I, I can do a couple of these. And then two weeks turned into four. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. And then the end of the year, I'm like, man, I got to do 60 more of these things. Right. Um, but luckily, you know, my, my daughters helped me out with them and they love doing them. I'm like, dad, whose turn is it today? Dad, whose turn is it today? So, you know, and I think that is a testament to kind of how this community works too. I think everybody kind of pulled each other up. Like when any of us feel down, someone's there to kind of pick us up. And that's how the Franklin works. I know that's how North Andover works. Yeah, I would totally agree with you. I, I say that a lot um, with a lot of the, we just completed an amazing Christmas drive. And the reality is this community always steps up with different mm -hmm. things. And, and you were obviously visible. And I say visible is the fact that I think you're one of, one of the few principals in town, um, no disrespect to any other ones, but I think you embrace a little bit of the other ways to communicate through social media or whatever. And I know that's not for everybody, uh, but I heard your voice. I saw your face during this period of time. And again, the remote learning um, was probably a nice way of saying it. I, I think it was, you know, we really just kind of were feeling ourselves out. I mean, I like Gilly's line of flying the plane while building it. And uh, I think we're better off now than we were before. But one of the things that I was very outspoken in the springtime was the social emotional aspects of our kids. The virus is serious. The virus is deadly. Uh, worst thing that's ever happened in my life and most people's lives. Um, but as much as the virus is so horrible, I am concerned about the, uh, you know, what the future is going to hold because of what's happened social emotionally. So I actually got on. I got on a couple of Zooms with your guidance counselor as well as all the elementary school guidance counselors because I think we were doing a really good job with checking in on social and emotionally with our high school kids and our elementary school kids. But from a youth center standpoint, we really weren't doing much uh, for the elementary school. So we jumped on with your guidance counselors and we actually ended up doing some Zoom programming to try to connect some of the, the, the mostly the fourth and fifth graders, but just trying to check on that. You know, what was your take then? And if you could tell me how you feel about it now in terms of the social emotional aspect of basically what the last nine months has been for your kids? It's been, it's been hard on them. I think... The spring was much harder than it is now. I, th I think the hybrid model that we're working through now, it's amazing what I see every day. When, when these kids are bouncing out of their car, they come two days a week, Craig. You know, they're home three days, one of which is live with their teachers, and two are kind of on your own days. But those days that they're in school, you just see their smiles ear to ear beaming. The spring was hard. It was difficult to connect. You know, we didn't know if students weren't logging on because they were having technical difficulties or if they were just not choosing to log on or if there were issues and they were upset. And it, to make those connections lasting 
during the spring was probably some of the hardest work that the teachers and guidance counselors and nurses and everybody in the building ha have ever done. Surprisingly, I was, I, I, I'll admit, I was nervous about the hybrid model. I know it's the safest way to go, but I was nervous about the social emotional well-being of being home three days a week and only in school twice. But as time progressed, and I could see it from my principal standpoint, but I also saw my own daughters, they, they're doing great at home. I mean, on the at-home days, they're working at their own pace, they're figuring out. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, what these kids are missing this year. You know, oh, they're not gonna get through the curriculum. Oh, they're not gonna do this. They're missing this, they're missing that. But it's, it's important for us to take a step back sometimes and think about what are they gaining from this too? Like, what are they getting out of this? I mean, my daughters in the spring didn't know how to turn on their computer. Now they're flipping tabs. I mean, the independence, the flexibility, the adaptability that kids are learning now, I think that is balancing some of the other things and being in school for those two days and being able to see their friends. And when they're six feet away, masks on, the teacher has a mask on. I know people were nervous, oh, but it's, it's like a, an asylum in there. Nobody's doing anything, it's like a jail. When I walk down those hallways, when I pop into those classrooms, Rick, it is like any other year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I gotta jump in here. I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm also, I'm a half full, not a half empty on the glass. Uh, to me, there's been a tremendous amount of silver linings in this whole thing. Believe me, I don't ever want to have a year like this again. <laughs> so. um, and when we, on December 31st, when we kick 2020 out the window, I don't want something like that to come back again. But I am overly impressed with how kids have handled situations. I am overly impressed while we, that we've all learned different things, uh, and whether it mean even better technology-wise, et cetera, et cetera. I think we as a community have done a great job of trying to connect the kids and keep those relationships going. Obviously, it's an ongoing battle, and I'll continue to worry about the social and emotional, and that's why we got to be back in school, and I'm hoping – we're on January 2nd right now. We're supposed to go back to our, our hybrid method on Monday. I hope we do. I think it's imperative for us to be back in school, at least on a hybrid method. Um, I'm hoping next year that we're back five days a week and we're back to as much normal as we can probably say. But So you got through this the spring. You, were, as I said, visible, vocal, principal, really loved following your stuff. Kind of really knew where the Franklin community was during this period of time. Uh, and then the summer came along, and uh, your your daughters obviously involved themselves with our summer programs, and, and this was, it was nice in the summer. Uh, obviously, we were wearing masks, we were following guidelines, but we had a bit of a sense of normalcy with the weather and doing a number of different things. But what a lot of people don't know is you as a principal, now that's the dad that was picking his kids up and dropping them off and seeing the smiles, but you were behind the scenes along with the entire administrative team from the school department saying, okay, What's September going to look like? What can we do in September? And I think it was frustrating for you because it was frustrating for me to kind of not really get an idea of what we're doing. And we were at the whims of the State Board of Education and all those different things. And, you know, administrators at times were taking some, some pot shots in terms of like they haven't done anything. Well, they were really looking to get some direction. And it was a little bit different than like I don't have to respond to the State Board of Education. I have to respond to my superiors here and the Board of Health, et cetera, et cetera. But what was summer 2020 like? You're getting a bit of a sense of normalcy with your family, but you're behind the scenes saying, we got to do better than we did in the springtime. What was the summer like? Summer was long. It was, um, you know, we were at that high school. We did a summer institute with teachers and different staff members and administrators that first week after school ended in June. And then the following week, 4th of July week, we said, okay, we need a break because it's been a long three months. And then I think it was July 6th or 7th, right back at it. And we were working, I mean, six days a week, seven days a week sometimes. And I'm working all day. I'm taking my lunch break to go pick the girls up at summer fun just sure. to kind of get that little in infusion of spirit. Um, which was great on color day when they were all decked out in pink. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, we were, we were in that high school library and we, you know, we looked back to the spring to learn lessons, but we said, okay, but the spring was different. We have to focus on how we, like you said, how do we make that better? How do we make a better experience? I still have 
nightmares of all of the chart paper around the high school with every different model, every different possibility, every different pro and con to, ev to everything we could think of, everything that we would just literally, when you talk about throwing something at the wall to see what sticks, we threw everything at the wall to see what stuck. And like you said, we were waiting and waiting and waiting on the state to kind of give us more guidance. And you know, it was, oh, the Friday, we'll have it by, for you by Friday. Friday comes and goes, I'm like, all right, well, where is it? Right. So we did a lot of work. And then as we were figuring out these plans and kind of fine tuning the plans and vetting the plans, you know, we had parent groups, each school did some student groups to, to talk about, you know, what happened in the spring? What did you like? What did you not like? What do you hope for? What are you fearful? And what I loved in my student group, two of the kids, you know, I said, what do you really hope for? Or what do you, I can't remember if it was a hope or a fear. I think it was a fear that we're not gonna have field trips. And that kind of made me sit back for a minute and just say, man, so this is where our kids are. They're still happy. They're worried about field trips. Right. They're not worried about screen time. They're not worried about that. They're worried about the stuff that matters to kids. And that actually made me happy to hear that. Sure. So I remember going back and we, oops, sorry. And we, um, we talked a lot about stuff like that in the leadership groups. And then, like I said, I would go home, we'd have dinner, put the kids to bed, and then I was going back to Franklin to put stickers down on the floor all night just to make sure that the physical space was ready too. So, you know, it's tough when you hear, you know, they didn't do anything all summer, right. but it was a long summer and, you know, my, my wife loves the beach. I think it's her favorite place. And now my the twins especially have grown very, much accustomed to being at the beach and we didn't get many beach trips this year. I think we went twice. Right. Um, so it was for the greater good, which I know, but, it, but it's hard when you've got at the time, two, six year olds, a four year old and a one year old, you yeah. know, when yeah, like, you get, oh, I you gotta go to all. work again, guys. Sorry right. guys. Well, obviously we're hoping that next summer you'll get to the beach a heck of a lot more. So Kristen and, keeps telling me too. And, <laughs> and for all the principals and the administrators, assistant principals um, who used to, you know, I would joke around that I, I'd love to have some of the administrative jobs in the school department where you kind of seem to be off a little bit more in the summer. Where for me, the summer is probably my craziest time. Uh, but I saw how hard you guys worked uh, in the summer to get this done. Uh, bit of a shameless plug, but I actually, I told Gilly, uh, as well as any other um, administrator from the school department, that wanted to listen to me, that what we, what we were planning on doing during the summer could really be a huge test case for you, for the school department, okay? And the number one thing was, you know, could kids wear masks? And I think we we proved that that was a non-issue when you really look at it. But there were lots of other things. And again, I granted, you know, 90% of our programs in the summer were outside, a little bit different than inside, but we were inside. Um, what would you say as an administrator, you know, you saw it up close as a father, what did you learn from maybe some of the stuff that we did this summer that could help you say, yeah, we can do this in September? Honestly, Rick, you know, you mentioned it already. The masks was the biggest thing. It was unbelievable. That's, I mean, that's what everybody was nervous. The kids are never going to be able to wear them. They're not going to be able to do it. And your kids from my girls at six to your high school counselors, they were wearing them in 90 degree weather, sure. running around. And that, you know, you look for things to grasp onto, and I think that was the thing I grasped onto in the beginning, like those first few weeks. Like well, the first day I asked Anna, I remember, how did you do with the mask? Oh yeah, I kept it on. Well, I, no, dad, I, I'm sorry, I, I took it off when I had snack. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, it'd be tough to eat with it on, Anna. Sure. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, I know, but I kept it on. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. The next day, Catherine, eh? yeah, I kept it on. And as those days progressed, I'm like, and I'm pulling up at 12.30 or whatever time it was, and I'm seeing all the kids in their lines waiting to be picked up, wearing their masks. That was what I grabbed onto to say, we can do this. Like, this is going to be okay. And I referenced you in that program many times sure. when talking with parents and teachers and administrators and whomever, that masks wasn't gonna be the issue. So right. let's just work on the assumption that masks are gonna work and let's focus on the important stuff. Let's focus on what, what we're gonna do for these kids when we have them. Yeah, and I, I think you know if we can take any credit for anything, the mask is definitely something. I mean, I, 
I, I would love to have a, a dime for every time someone said you're not going to be able to wear masks and, and we're able to do that. And then obviously we learned a lot. I know I'm more educated in running the youth center now than I was in June in terms of dealing with stuff with the pandemic. Uh, but we were able to do anything. And I think the biggest thing was, and I know in talking to many administrators like yourself, just seeing a sense of normalcy or feeling a sense of normalcy and the kids smiling again was huge. And I know... You know, you've heard me say this many times. I would have loved to have gone back to September five days a week, especially at the elementary school level and the middle school. Um, we didn't do it, and that's that's okay. Uh, we're at least in the hybrid method, and we'll get back to five days a week as as soon as we possibly can. So you, I would like to say you enjoyed the end of the summer, but you really didn't get a chance to enjoy it. First first day of school at the Franklin in September, uh, I know was a big day for you um, as you rolled out everything you were doing. Take me through pretty much the fall in terms of what it was like running a school during now back to school um, in a pandemic. So the first the first part of September, you know, if you remember, we had the the um, commissioner extended the start date. Correct. Made us have or allowed us to have more PD time. And I think that that was great because it gave us more of a chance to work with our staff to show them what the school like looked like to be able to get a feel that we could do this and we could be safe because for a lot of those staff members, August 31st or whatever the first day we came back was, that was the first time they stepped foot in the building since they left March 13th. And there's a lot of emotion that goes with that. I remember I, it was a month or two before I went back to the building and my notes were still on the desk. Sure. You know, everything was still up. My weekly communication was on the board from behind me. And it said something like, oh, Friday the 13th and a full moon. What else could go wrong this week? Right. What did I know? Right, Rick? But um, so getting through that and then getting into then the announcement came that the first six days were going to be remote. And at first I was disappointed because like, you you know, Rick, you said this and I think everybody would agree. Everyone wants to be back five days. You know, sure. I, we were praying for it. We kept trying all like all there were so many of those chart papers around that had every kid five days and how could we do it um and i was a little disappointed personally when that announcement came in that the first six days were going to be remote but i think it was really for the best and it goes back to what we keep going back to it allowed the teachers to build some relationships with their entire class at the same time because it wasn't the split cohort a cohort b they had all the kids there for six days and it wasn't easy and you know, the remote days especially at the elementary level, they're really difficult when you think about having six, my, my two six-year-old first graders are live on a Google Meet pretty much the entire day. That's, that's taxing. Sure. Um, but then September 24th, that first Thursday when we came back, man, we had the music pumping. Parents were incredible. We completely changed how we dropped kids off in the morning to account for having students come in different entrances so that they wouldn't be, we wouldn't be crossing paths as much and hallways wouldn't be as crowded. And they nailed it. And every day since they've nailed it. And, but that first day when those first kids were popping out of their cars, just seeing their smiles beaming through their masks, like that's how big their smiles are. You can see it in their eyes. And it just, it made the summer almost kind of fade away. Like, I won't necessarily say it made it worth it. It was still a lot of work. Sure. But it was, it made it go away and say, okay, you know what? We're here. We made it. We have kids back. Teachers were psyched. Teachers were dancing around the hallways, like welcoming kids. And then the next, I was, I always get nervous when we do something, like if we've done a theme day or something, that cohort B is going to get the shaft a little bit because we've already done the big hoopla for cohort A. But it's almost like cohort B is even a little bigger sometimes, which right. is cool. But it was just such a great feeling to hear children in the building again. I mean, we hadn't, I, there hadn't been a student in that building for six months. Sure. We couldn't do our first grade orientation, which killed me and the first grade teachers. You know, we were devastated because we couldn't do it in such a way that we were used to doing it. And new family orientation, like it was mainly through emails and my videos and things like that. But once we were there, once we were in it, in September 24th hit, it felt different, but the same. 
Yeah, and it, and it was interesting. I think we had a good start to the year, um, and you know, obviously, um, you know, I talk to my staff every day, and it's interesting. We we start off our staff meeting basically asking who's on the COVID list in terms of like staff and. You know, we've had over the course of the fall, um, we dealt with our first part-time staff that were positive and uh, dealing with a lot of close contacts. Um, you know, we've only had four kids that have worked for us that were positive. Uh, and obviously they were quarantined, all four of them, no symptoms, um, but had to be away from work. And there was close contact. So we had to kind of juggle like, well, who's on the COVID list today? Uh, and not stigmatizing, just next man up, we bring in a person in. And we were actually able to keep the youth center open every single day. We started before the school department started and, and actually we wrapped up uh, basically the 23rd of December. Um, I would always be telling my staff like, uh, I think we're gonna be okay during the fall. I'm worried about mid-November up until Christmas. And uh, probably at the end of October, you know, I got a little nervous. The high school actually had closed um, their first time uh, for a short period of time. But elementary school, middle school, still plugging along. Um, and then obviously leading up to Christmas, we have had bigger numbers in town, bigger numbers in our school department. And obviously the school department tracks it and you can actually see it on their website of how many per, per school or whatever. But we're continuing to plug along. What was it like for you as you started to see, and now again, you're running a school, you're happy the kids are back, you're dealing with the parents, you're, this is great. But now we see the numbers rising. What's going through the administrator's mind at that point? You know, I was I was nervous we were going to close. It was, and then when the high school went down, I personally got nervous. Okay, this this is the beginning of it. This is this is the beginning of the end. But to a, te a testament to the town, Board of Health, testament to our nursing staff, Cheryl Barzak, who sure. leads our nurses, who you know, she's amazing, and she has a way about her. That she can just calm anybody down yeah, in any situation. She does. And um and my nerves subsided a little bit. The high school came back, things were looking good. You know, we had you could see the cases rising in the department in the school department and in the town. And then after Thanksgiving recess, you know, at home, that's where it hit. That's when Franklin Franklin started having some rising numbers and and we plugged through. There were tough times, you know, it's hard when you're talking about, you're trying to be as communicative as possible. You know, we're informing people, but right before Christmas or right before winter break, I mean, there was two weeks where I was sending two to three letters a week saying, you know, we have a positive case and sure. and, and it's hard. It's as a, as a leader, as an administrator, I started being nervous about, you know, what, when are people going to start losing faith in me? And, the, and my ability and our school's ability to keep their kids safe. The, the positive is that the parents have been great. When their kids are showing symptoms, they're keeping them home. A lot of times a student will come in and they'll say, you know what, I'm not feeling well. They go call the nurse right away, figure it out. They might get them sent home. We're not spreading in the schools, which right. is nice. Right. It's just a matter of how do we, we can't control what we can't control. So wherever these kids might be getting it or our staff members might be getting it, it's not in the schools. So we're hopeful that we can continue the model that we're doing. And like you said, we're coming back on Monday to our hybrid model as, as of right now, you know? And, um, and I'm hopeful that we can just continue to plug away. And I don't, I'm not naive, I don't think you know, oh, it's 2021. We're golden now. You right. know, everything's going to be better. But I'm hopeful that if we can continue to follow the protocols, you know, the three W's, all that stuff, and just keep being honest with each other and open lines of communication with parent between parents and school, which has been great so far, I really believe that we can continue in this model. I know it was a difficult decision for the upper administration to go remote those last two and a half days. Um, those, those last two weeks, like, like I just said, I had a few, a few letters each week. So it was a bit of a relief to me because I was starting to feel the pressure of it. And I think 
you know, not universally, you know, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna please everybody. But I think for the most part, people understood and were accepting of, okay, let's go remote these last two and a half days. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you really look at it, those two days were probably the okay two days. Uh, you know, we're heading up, not, if you listen to most people, not a ton gets done right before Christmas. But, um, you know, my attitude, not to steal a Ryan Holiday line, but the obstacle is the way. Um, I obviously think we need to keep plugging away. Uh, um, I agree with you. Uh, there is not any proof to me that things are being spread in the school system, that things, uh, the virus is being spread at the youth center. Um, I know where most of this stuff is being spread, and there's some, some behaviors that people need to be a little smarter on. Um, and again, you know, the holidays will be tough, right? So we saw an influx. If you look at the numbers a little bit after Christmas, uh, I think we're obviously watching these 72 hours after New Year's. Um, but again, uh, my hope is that you know, we deal with it, um, and again, not to stigmatize, stigmatize the virus, um, but we just got to keep moving forward and uh, control the controllables uh, and, and get this done. So I'm hoping we're back on January 4th. I know you are. I know the majority of our parents and kids want to be back, and we, you know, we just got to take it day by day, and hopefully we can do this. So let me, you know, we got time for a few more questions, and I want to ask you, so you get thrown in, you're, you're only a six and a half year principal. It's not like you've been driving the ship for 30 years or whatever, but how are you a better principal or a different principal um, from what you learned in this year of the pandemic? Well, I think one of the things that has changed about me is that I'm much more I'm much more decisive. I'm much more definitive, I think, now. I think this, this pandemic, there needed to be a lot of decisions made. It wasn't, you know, oftentimes I would say, okay, you know, let me think on that. And I like to reflect and, and think back and kind of look at things from all angles. But I think what I've found is through this pandemic, my instincts are pretty good. And to go with my gut sometimes because there's been a lot over the past nine months or whatever that a decision just needed to be made. There wasn't time to say, okay, let's, let's stop and think about this and go through it. And then truthfully, I think I've become a better collaborator in terms of my colleagues. I mean, I've got a great group of principals that I get to work with um, from all the schools, from the ABECC up to the high school. And, you know, the elementary schools have always sort of worked together just because we're all at the same level, but I don't think we've worked together at the level that we're currently working. Sure. And I think it's been amazing because, you know, you get to see the experience of Rich Cushing and get to talk to him about what he's done in all of his many, 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 many jobs over the sure. years that he loves to tell you about, um, including the time that he was wrangling horses, trying to start <laughs> a school on a farm. Mm. Um, but to be able to share ideas and you know we, i i don't even know how many open google docs we have between the eight of us i think it is now um just going back and forth with you know oh we have to do a communication on this okay i'm gonna someone will take the lead i'm gonna draft this one up and then i'll share it with you and we can all revise it and we can edit it for our level as necessary so i think that's something that's really been great for me professionally that's come out of this yeah i think the collaboration across the board partnerships have been developed that should have been developed a long time ago collaboration should have been a bigger pot and to nobody's fault it's just the pandemic has actually forced us to do it and again i'll i'll, I'll echo silver linings i believe that uh, there's a lot more people in this community that are working together more out of a need with the pandemic that should always continue to work together once we get out of this, um, I've been pretty outspoken in general throughout the country, the world, locally, um, that there's been a lack of leadership. And my thing to your point is I just need people that will be willing to make decisions. I think a lot of people have been very wishy-washy uh, during the pandemic. And I get it. You know, everyone's kind of fearful of making the wrong decision where I believe the ultimate lead is, you know, and you said going with your gut. I, I you're not a reckless guy, Joe. You you do your homework. You're going to make a good decision, which is good for your school, the community, et cetera. And that's what I'm looking for with a lot of leaders is um, 
step up to the plate. You got to make some decisions. And at the end of the day, you're not going to keep everybody happy. That's the, that's the funky thing with everything, but you can't be afraid uh, to make a decision. You know, one of my claims to fame that I will always have, uh, I, I'm very proud of many things we've done here, but I will always be proud of what we did this summer. And most people told me I was crazy. Most people said it was never going to happen. And you know what? Maybe it wouldn't, but I was not going to at least try. And that's what we've done. So it brings me up to, you know, we have seen, uh, you know, we have not closed the doors since the summer at the youth center. We're opening up January 4th. We're ready to go. And one of the things that I don't think we give enough credit to is our kids, right? So your, your students, um, you know, your kids that are working with your kids, whether it be in a mentorship or whatever. We just had our winter training on New Year's Eve morning. Uh, to bring on our whole new staff, and we call them the mass superheroes, and we have a wall downstairs which will always remember the ones from the summer. We have pictures of each one of the groups, and we added the fall group, and we'll eventually ask the winter group. One of the things I'm most impressed is the resiliency of our kids. Um, I have had to ask my staff to do things that, and that constantly had to hear me talk about you know, guidelines and you need to do this. And if you want to be part of working here, I need to make sure you're making the right decisions. When you think of the resiliency of kids, and again, you're dealing with elementary school, but you see enough of other kids too. How impressed are you at with the resiliency of kids? Unbelievably. These kids have gone through something we never had to go through. Absolutely. Kids. This is, it's unbelievable. You know, we say uncharted waters, un, uncharted territory, whatever. We've got young kids, you know, my own kids, my elementary school kids, all of these kids, and they come to school every day with a smile. They, you know, they struggle too. And, you know, sure. we talk about it. And those at-home days, yeah, my girls are doing well. They don't love them. They don't right. love being home and not interacting with their friends. Luckily, I have like 47 kids, so, you know, it's, all, sure. it's fine. But it's, um, but it's hard on them. But the fact that they come in, if you're a cohort A or whatever, they come in every Monday and Thursday ready to learn, ready to follow those guidelines, ready to listen to their teacher and try to get the most they can out of the two days a week that they have in person right now. I don't know how they do it. Right. You know, I, I don't know if I could have done it when I was six, seven, eight years old, being home to my own accord sometimes. You know, and we do. We have kids that are home working very independently for the course of the day because parents have to work even if they're working from home they got to work so this has been trying times on everybody and you're right we do we give a lot of credit to our teachers well-deserved credit to our teachers they work sure. harder than anybody right now parents well-deserved credit to our parents because they their lives completely changed with all of this and then our kids i mean you know the younger kids some of them this is just what they think school is. Yeah. And it's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, that, that really the is. Kindergartners just think that, oh, yeah, it's just, I mean, I guess they always used to go just half day. But but our first graders or new kids to the community, like this is just what North Andover school is to them. And, and that's tough. It's a tough pill to swallow. But they're doing it. And they're coming back every day. And they're trying their best. And Yeah, I mean, the results. They're amazing. They really are. And I, you know, I'm older than you, but I look back, if this happened when I was an elementary school kid or middle school kid or a high school kid, I wouldn't have done well. I wouldn't have been a great student at remote learning, I'll be honest with you. Um, I would have been home by myself, both parents uh, working. Um, and the reality is I'm not sure I'd plug in all the time. I, I wonder how that might have affected me long term. Uh, and I look at these kids here, and that's why they'll have I have such tremendous respect for our kids. There's glitches here and there. There are some kids that need to do a little bit more. But overall, the resilience of these kids, and I tell my high school kids in particular that they are going to be so strong from this. I don't think that anything coming across their plate in years to come that they won't be able to, to deal with it because they've dealt with so much here. Let me finish up with going back to Joe Clark, the educator. So you're looked at as a mentor to a lot of people. Um, how about that young um, educator right now, maybe a classroom teacher, maybe somebody uh, that's got plans to become the next Joe Clark? What, <laughs> what's your advice to you know young school teachers and maybe young school teachers that have plans to maybe someday be the Joe Clark and the principal of a school? 
I think you give me more credit than I deserve on that one. I think um, I think everyone just needs to find their way. And I think one of the things that I found as I was growing up is I had to find myself first. And I mean, I was my my wife doesn't always believe me, but I was painfully shy through high school. Like it was. It was painful. Like I reflect back on it, I'm like, oh my gosh, like how did I even have friends? Like I didn't talk. I didn't and you know, that summer camp is where I found myself. And honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to go into. I wasn't one of these kids who, you know, in third grade was like, I love my teacher, I wanna be a teacher. It took time for me to figure out exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And camp was where I found it. Um so as I kind of found my voice and found my personality that's what I brought to the classroom and then that's what I brought so I guess my advice for those young educators out there is just you know be yourself just find your voice make connections with your kids because that is the most important thing at the elementary school level too the most important thing we teach them is race and I will preach that from any mountaintop but if you make those connections with the kids if you feel like you're making a difference, you're making a difference. And you just have to do that. Find your own way. If you want to become a principal, really think about it sometimes. Sure. <laughs> but it's um it's different, but it's rewarding. It's rewarding in its own ways, like like any change in career you make. It's hard to believe that you were painfully shy. Uh, obviously, I, I didn't know you back then, but what I know of you now, you definitely are not the painfully shy type, which uh, obviously is a good lesson to kids that we grow, right? We, yeah. we, we change, et cetera. My last question is, and I, uh, and I don't want to uh, upset the Franklin community uh, or anybody else, but you know, there's a lot of people that are big supporters of yours, and I've been in social gatherings where we've talked about the impact you've had on your school and your community. And uh, Franklin parents, he's not leaving. Uh, but the question we have is, and I, I see it, and a lot of the parents have said it to me, I, I see something beyond a principalship for you. I think you have the leadership skills. You also have the kind of the characteristics that I could see you moving up. I don't want to call it the food chain, but, you know, is superintendent in the future? Is something more in the Board of Education in the future for you? Um, what does the future hold for uh, Principal Clark? Oh, that's the million-dollar question for all of us, isn't it, Rick? Sure. <laughs> um I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know where I'm going to end up. I love, absolutely love what I'm doing right now. And it'd be hard to imagine leaving that. I think the hardest part for me, and I reflect on this quite a bit, is when I went to Endicott, although I had my Endicott students there with me, you know, they were adults, they were 18, 19, 21, whatever. Um, I missed being part of a community. I missed being part of that elementary school. And I mean, that's the piece of the job that I love the absolute most. So will there be more in the future? Maybe, I don't know, we'll see. You know, I, I didn't know Endicott was in my future. I didn't know I was gonna end up back in North Andover. So thankful that I did, especially because my wife made us move to North Andover because she grew up in town. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, uh, the future is bright, and no matter where I go, um, it's just about how can I make the best impact on kids. Absolutely. Well said, and way to, way to wrap up. We appreciate you coming in. Obviously, we have a, a tremendous amount of respect for you personally and what you're doing over at the Franklin School. I think all of us here at the YC appreciate your efforts as, as well as all the other school building principals. Uh, the obstacles, the way we're going to keep plugging away here. Um, I do think there's brighter days ahead of us. You know, high school kids ask me all the time, so what do you think? What do you think? And, and my take is, I think we're in for a rough winter. I don't mean to depress people, but I, I don't think that all of a sudden because the calendar changed to January 1 that things are going to be great. Um, I tell the kids all the time, I got a March 15th date in my mind. And how ironic that is. It's almost a year after. Yeah. 
Uh, if we can get to March, um, I think we're going to see some brighter days. I think the rollout of the vaccination in the next nine months of weather is going to help. Um, but I don't see the spring uh, changing tremendous from what the winter is. I do think our summer is going to be better, but not to depress your daughters. I see us wearing masks next summer at Summer Fun. And I'm okay with that. I think we prove we can do it. And I think my first glimmer of hope is September of 21. I, I'm hoping that you go back to somewhat of a normal year next year. And I think, you know, a year from now, we're going to have, we're going to be back to as, as much normalcy as we can. You know, as a, as a music and a sports lover, I want to go to a concert. <laughs> I want to, I want to go to a Celtics game instead of watching them on the TV. Um, so, you know, I think brighter days are coming, but we got to keep moving forward. And that's my big thing. One day at a time. Um, we can't, we can't roll up in that bed and wait for, you know, everything to be who we get. You got to keep fighting. And I think we're doing that. We're doing a great job in North Andover. And obviously you are. So once again, Joe, thanks for coming on the You Sent It podcast. And as we finish every podcast, we always say too much passion is never enough passion.